Welcome to our podcast, Psychiatric Services, From Pages to Practice. In this podcast, we highlight new research or columns published this month in the journal Psychiatric Services. I'm Lisa Dixon, editor of Psychiatric Services, and I'm here with podcast editor and my co-host, Josh Berezin. Hi, Josh. Hi, Lisa. Today, we've got another interview with Dr. Delbert Robinson on interesting questions about the use of LAIs. Yeah, it's another really uh, interesting paper that um, I think you'll uh, you'll enjoy the interview. Yeah, we're we're liking the interviews. We are. We're we're moving towards them, but uh, don't worry, we'll be uh, back summarizing some articles soon. I'm sure. So we're very lucky to have Dr. Delbert Robinson come and talk with us about his and his colleagues' recent article titled "Focused Ethnographic Examination of Barriers to Use of Long-Acting Injectable Antipsychotics." And Dr. Robinson, let me see if I can get this right on one take, is the professor of psychiatry and molecular medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. How'd I do? Great. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're really pleased. Lisa and I both really enjoy the article, and we're very excited to have you on. And thanks for your interest in the study. So before we dive into the study, how did you, what, what, what was your path to this uh, particular area of research? One of the things that's always sort of intrigued me is we've had long-acting formulations of antipsychotics for a long time, you know, several decades, but there's a lot of data that use varies a lot by country, hmm. you know, within the sort of industrialized world. So the U.S. is different than Europe, but even within Europe, there are very different rates of use, which sort of implies something's going on besides just the basic molecule. Mm-hmm. Right. Because the molecule is the same, <laughs> but if you, ch- if you cross borders, uh, the, the usage varies dramatically. So it's always been sort of intriguing, oh, what's going on and we got the opportunity to try a sort of a different way of trying to figure out what's going on because we were part of a PTN which is a practice transformation network that's funded by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and in that context Northwell was providing technical support four clinics across New York State. And so this gave us the opportunity to sort of look at issues or barriers in terms of LAI use. It was a fortuitous sort of (laughs) uh, coming together of a lot of different sort of interests. And so what's the traditional way that people have looked at this question about long-acting injectable um, use of the barriers to, to more uptake? You, the, the way that's been used uh, primarily is to give surveys to usually doctors and nurses where they answer questions about their beliefs about LAIs and what they feel are sort of barriers. There have been a few very interesting studies where, where researchers actually went into a clinic and sort of sat in on discussions um, about LAIs with patients and the prescribers. And so what's different about the the approach that you and, and your group took? Well, there's a there's a very interesting, at least I think I we thought, <laughs> a method which was actually mostly used in industrial studies. Because if a manufacturer of a particular product may note that the product isn't being used as much as they thought. And so they use this, often this ethnographic approach to sort of understand why the product isn't being used. And what that involves is people not related to the particular clinic come in and they do these very in-depth interviews with anyone who might be associated, and usually with the product. Um, 
And they have set sort of probe questions that you start the interviews, and then there's a set way that once somebody identifies a, an issue, then it's dealt, you know, they delve into much greater detail. And to give you an example, one of my colleagues had done a study where a particular medical device wasn't used very much, and they... <laughs> And so they went in for the manufacturer and did the interviews, and they found out that the reason the device wasn't used very much was that the packaging for the device, hmm. if it was a medical device, was very elaborate, and staff members who had long fingernails <laughs> would break <laughs> their nails when they were opening the package. And because of that, the staff didn't like that particular device, and it didn't get used nearly as much as it would have. So... Then the company obviously took that inside and redesigned the packaging so that it was more friendly to the staff. So it seems like it's a way that you can get a little bit deeper in terms of understanding what the barriers are. Like that wouldn't be intuitive maybe from talking to the to the physician, but the people who are on the front lines who have to open the package might be the people who. Um, so it's a way of kind of deepening your your pool and also asking kind of more. It's more. like user centered design type of questions, right? right? You don't necessarily have thought of to put on your if you were doing a survey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Question number f- twenty-five: <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have you ever had problems with your nails? Using our <laughs> um, so, so um, Dr. Robinson, w- when I read this and I looked at your method, it reminded me of sort of the the new, or maybe not so new, but but the the trend to use basically qualitative methods to understand. A whole variety of phenomena from the perspectives of of different stakeholders and and in some ways to develop hypotheses as opposed to say test hypotheses is is that a reasonable way to look at it oh yeah it's it's essentially a, a structured sort of way of doing this qualitative work and again as you said you develop lots of insights, which then you could later make hypothesis for, uh, um, you know, a traditional research study to test that hypothesis. So maybe with that introduction, we can you can kind of walk us through what the what the study did, who, what clinics you recruited from, who you spoke to. You also expanded the scope of uh, the type of people who you were talking to, and then uh, maybe walk through what sorts of questions you were asking, and then we can dive into some of the results a little bit. Right. So one of the one of again the core things we're able to do was the interviewers come in and they have no relationship to the clinic. And that's important so that people feel free to offer their insights without feeling that there would be any sort of repercussions. It was done through the Care Transitions Network, so that meant there were six different facilities in New York State that participated. And in each of those, psychiatrists, nurses were interviewed, patients were interviewed, therapists, and the clinical administrators. And the method is, again, there's, there are set probe questions and then an interview guide of how you continue the questioning once, you get, once someone des- describes an insight. Those were all audio recorded then they're transcribed, and then the next step is they are, each of the insights are put into a particular set format of what's called a need statement. And that's a statement that has a set syntax about if a particular thing is going to occur, then this needs to be done. Could you give us a, is there a, like an, an easily understandable example of a, of a neat right. statement? Okay. So, for example, one of the verbatim quotes is one of the patients said, uh, people don't use LAIs because they don't like the needle. Then that is, in a need statement, it would be, it would be in, 
in order for patients to get potential benefits from LAI, they would have to overcome uh, concern or fear of needles. Mm. So that's yes. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially putting uh, the insights because obviously they come in in very different formats and how people speak that they're put in this very set sort of syntax. So there was 1,211 of these need statements that came from all the interviews. Then they're, all, then they're put into clusters. So for example, many people may identify the same particular issue or need. And so those are obviously collapsed. Uh, and then they're grouped into overall themes. Uh, that's the first step. Then the next step is each of the needs is given a score based on its impact on different levels of care, from patient care, um, how the clinic operates, etc. And also a measure of how much the person felt that they had the ability to overcome that particular problem. And your, your occasional chuckles lead me to believe that these uh, summary statements represent a tremendous amount of work and effort on the part of the people who are uh, doing these both these interviews and the coding of them, and maybe the computers too. What, the reason I'm chuckling is on my computer screen, in order that I remembered it was 1,211, there is a photo of actually... Again, all these statements are, you know, written in a computer, and then they are printed out on what are what are the equivalent of a very large post-it, <laughs> and there is an enormous room <laughs> where all the post-it are put into into groupings, <laughs> and and then then of course it's been, been put back into. Um, uh, computer software, but that's why I'm laughing because I had staring at a photo of an incredibly large room <laughs> with <laughs> post-it notes grouped into groups going down one wall and the other wall. It's kind of comforting to know that even with all of our technology, sometimes a good old-fashioned post-it note is still the way to go. <laughs> um, so you know, I also wanted to make sure that I, I don't know if we got to this, but you, you didn't just interview clinicians at, at clinics. You also expanded the process out to other stakeholders. Uh, correct, because our concern was that, obviously, you know, clinic administrators, therapists, patients, uh, psychiatrists, and nurses are sort of on the front line about making the, you know, making de treatment decisions. But there are there are a lot of people who are not at the clinic who have a lot of influence in terms of what's available. So we actually did interview some representatives from the pharmaceutical industry, also the insurance industry, and we also interviewed uh, a representative from a national advocacy uh, organization. And so that very long and detailed process involving all the post-it notes that you described, the, correct me if I'm wrong, the basic idea is to figure out what the most salient themes are in figuring out what low, like what the barriers are to more uptake of the use of long-acting injectables. Well, I think one of the things is, again, there's been obviously prior work on this. And some of the things we, we found are obviously replicated earlier work. So maybe it would be useful to sort of talk about some of the themes that haven't been as prominent in prior work mm -hmm. um, that we're able to sort of identify. And I think one of the overarching themes, so to speak, is that even though we've had these medicines for a long time, that we still have enormous uh, lack of education about them at many different levels. And I think that, that again, is, 
is something that's you know unusual in the fact that <laughs> these medicines have been available for a long time. A lot of the prior work has identified that from a patient perspective, one of the most basic things is that most patients have never who take antipsychotics have never been informed that this is an option for them. Uh, and again, unfortunately, we found that again. But one of the big issues was that even among the psychiatrists, there was some lack of basic knowledge about the differences between LAIs and oral in terms of side effect profiles, those sorts of things. But I think from the big knowledge gap was the patients often reported that the person on their treatment team that they, in fact, would prefer to talk about the uh, using an LAI versus an oral was actually their therapist and not their prescriber because uh, they spent a lot more time with the therapist and they felt actually sort of more comfortable with the therapist. But the therapist often had very limited knowledge about mm -hmm. LAIs and therefore they couldn't really provide the support for patients when they were trying to make their treatment decisions. Um, interestingly, there was also a gap among clinic administrators in terms of knowing the, you know, the administrative part of being able to provide LAIs at their clinic. And part of that is a lot of clinics don't provide that or don't have a good support system for it. So administrators didn't have often a good source of information like, oh, if I want to sort of set up the administrative things that need to be done at LAI clinic, it wasn't that they could call, you know, they didn't have another friend who worked in another clinic that they knew they could call up and get and have a good source of information. Um, and another, I think, big issue came, which is team communication. Um, the 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 therapists often had concerns that their insights were not being taken into account by the prescriber. Um, and again, I think the patients were saying they need support on all levels and with all members of the team for their when they're making their decisions. And it didn't seem that that we have all the team members having the level of information that they need to do that. Yeah, Delbert, when I was reading your article and that section on communication, I was actually saddened and, and struck by the, the comment that the therapists assumed, or many didn't, many assumed that the prescribers didn't read any of their notes or have, uh, you know, really participate in in the communication. And I, I read that out loud and I thought to myself, this this article is way beyond the issue of LAIs. It, it has a lot to say about care. Oh, yeah, um, I agree with you. Well, I think that you, um, also in some of your discussion about the information you got from the insurance companies as well, I think one of, one of the interesting kind of questions is how much of how many of the barriers are these ind individual kind of level factors about the interaction between a clinician and a patient and how many are more kind of uh, like systems barriers right like I think about what, what you mentioned about clinics not being set up to provide the, the resources and the backup to provide the service and the, the high cost um, so did you what do you think about that balance between more system level barriers and more kind of individual level barriers well I think on on for example on the payer issue that is something that not just from you know psychiatry that is sort of all of medicine 
that payers are reluctant often to pay for something up front that may only later produce cost savings. Uh, so that's sort of an advocacy uh, challenge that I think we have um, to make sure that people get access to things that are effective and that's, you know, that's just something that's going to fall on to us. And in fact, one of the payers did mention about we have a role as clinicians to make advocacy to them. So there's that, but also there, there are just really basic, again, I'm striking basic educational mm -hmm. issues that we certainly, as a field, could deal with. For example, the therapist, again, not saying that, that they necessarily need to know the exact dosing of each of these LAIs, but but a lot of them lack basic information about globally how do they work, what's the difference between a long-acting formulation and, and an immediate release formulation, um, or in, you know, and basically what would be the things that, w that are the advantages of particularly LAIs and also what are the disadvantages. And again, it's sort of striking that the team doesn't also have this basic knowledge. And if the team doesn't, obviously the patient mm. don't get that information. So do you think that the, the, the next step in either research or even addressing these barriers is, is that where you would focus on education or kind of like what's, what would be the next, um, the, the next step in this line of uh, research for you and your, your group? Well, one of the things that we did develop as part of the Care Transitions Network project is we developed some educational programs for about, one, about antipsychotics and then in general, and two, about long-acting injectable antipsychotics specifically. And they were developed for team members who are not uh, either nurses or, or uh, psychiatrists hmm. um, so that everyone at least had a clear understanding of you know the basics um, uh, and that that was quite well received by a lot of the therapists because again they understand that they need you know they wanted to know <laughs> They want to know the basics about the medicines that their uh, their patients were taking. So I think it's just one of, of many interesting insights that you uh, you highlight in the paper, and um, it's a great read. And we really appreciate you coming to talk with us on the podcast. Okay. Well, again, thanks for your interest in the work. Well, that's it for today. We invite you to visit our website ps.psychiatryonline.org to read the article we discussed in this episode, as well as other great research. We also welcome your feedback. Please email us at psjournal at psych.org. You can also rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to it. I'm Lisa Dixon. I'm Josh Berzin. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time.